Welcome to the Penguin Magic Podcast. I'm your host, Eric Tate. Bit of a return to the old format this week. We'll talk about that at the end of the podcast. The main event this week is comedy magician Taylor Hughes. We talk about his new book, his new magic special, and how magicians can learn from comedians and their DIY scene. Nick Lacapo isn't on the show this week, but don't worry, everything is fine. It was just a scheduling issue. Before all that, we kick things off with one of our quick fire segments where your favorite magicians speculate on the literature they would love to be lost at sea with. This week, touring magician and autism speaker Cody Clark joins me for Desert Island Magic Books. Cody Clark, thanks so much for joining me here on the Penguin Magic Podcast for Desert Island Magic Books. Let's suppose you wash up on a desert island with one magic book, but it's made of Tyvek, so it won't fall apart in the wind and the rain and the sand. What is your desert island magic book? I'm going to make the creative assumption that if I were to wind up on a desert island, I'd have some amnesia anyway and would need to relearn the basics of magic. <laughs> I, I think one of my favorite things about this uh, sort of thought exercise is listening to how literally people take it. Okay, you have some, we'll say you have some amnesia. <laughs> what, what, are you, what are you going to learn? Of the genre of first magic book that includes greats like the Mark Wilson Course in Magic and the Josh Jay's uh, New Beginner Magic Book, I don't remember off the top of my head what that one's called, but the one I'm going to choose is Nick Einhorn's Practical Encyclopedia of Magic. You know, I've never read that, but Nick Einhorn is a very, very clever human being. What, what is it about that book that you like so much? Well, it's very picture based, uh, whereas as awesome as Mark Wilson and Tarbell one is, you have to literally read between the lines, which when you're brand new into magic, that's actually a pretty tall order, Mm -hmm. but everything is picture oriented. So I knew exactly where to place my hands for the different card tricks. Mm -hmm. And there's the primers for card magic, the primers for coin magic, the primers for envelope magic, and then some solid routines that even professional magicians should take a look at and use. I think that's really a great way to put it because um, as as I as I grow more in my role here at Penguin and I have people saying, hey, I'm getting into magic, what should I get? I see all these conversations about, oh, check out Royal Road to Magic or check out, um, you know, the... You know, this thing, and it's always books that were like from the 30s that have always been presented that way, but it's hard to read that stuff because it's written in a different time. And so a, a book like this that is very picture oriented and very, very uh, driven towards the, the beginner, it sounds like a fantastic book for a desert island and just a fantastic beginner's book in general. Yeah, I think we should be more conscious about the resources we recommend to beginners. Mm -hmm. We should definitely not throw out any of the resources, but maybe this combined with Josh Jay's book should be where we send people first. Yeah. Because I worry people are reading the more complicated, the ones that we don't think of as complicated, but are actually are to a newbie. Mm -hmm. And some people are ending their magic journey a bit prematurely. I think that I completely and 100% agree with you on that. I think that curating the way people get into magic is is one of the most important things we can do as elder magicians. Yeah, I 100% agree. We're wanting to move magic forward, and then with that, magic teaching should move forward too. Oh, man, it's it's an excellent book. Well, Nick Einhorn's Encyclopedia, it's a, the uh, Practical Encyclopedia of Magic is a fantastic book for Desert Island Magic Books. Thanks so much. Anytime. Thanks so much to Cody Clark for being on the show. He'll be back soon with an expansive interview about autism, magic, and performing for audiences on the spectrum. Now, on to the main event. Taylor Hughes and I go back a long ways. We were young, up-and-coming comics and magicians in L.A. over a decade ago, and we did a ton of underground shows on the L.A. comedy circuit. He has since gone on to tour the country, have a magic special on Amazon, and is now a new author on a book about how you can avoid misdirection in your day-to-day life. I grabbed some of his time via Zoom, and now you get to join our conversation. Taylor Hughes, welcome to the Pet and Gwen Magic Podcast. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, I know we have a lot to talk about today, because you you are a, like a man on a mission putting out content. <laughs> Oh man, I just feel like I'm gluing creative macaroni to a plate and going, is th- is this what you guys want? <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, will this I, one end up on the fridge? <laughs> if I'm not mistaken, you and I performed together like 15 years ago in Los Angeles, right? Long time ago. Yeah, yeah. it's been a it's been a minute. Well, and then uh we I, ran into each other briefly at IBM, but I think you were coming in late cuz you're always working. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, I oh it was yeah, we ran into each other in Pittsburgh at that convention. Um, and I was yeah. I was literally only there for a day and on my way to a, a gig at Keller's, but uh, it was good to see you. And uh, let's start with your new book, Misdirection, yeah. A Magician's Guide to Spotting and Avoiding Manipulation. Yeah, it's kind of a different take 
uh, for a, a, a magic book that is for the general public, but also has a lot of themes of magic in it. Well, tell me about it. Yeah, so uh, this book is all about how, you know, as magicians, we spend our whole life studying how to deceive people for fun. Mm-hmm. But then uh, I think we all notice how the same techniques we use to take advantage of people's attention or misdirect them have snuck into how people treat each other in business and politics and in some cases religion and mm-hmm. family. And so uh, I wrote a book where every chapter we tackle a different area of misdirection, like how misdirection seeps into social media, how misdirection seeps into sales and marketing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I teach a simple, you know, basic trick like the vanishing salt shaker yeah and then we explain how that same principle has uh weaseled its way into parts of our life where it shouldn't be so it's a it's a fun book about some tough subjects oh that's fascinating i mean especially like uh this this podcast is not uh political or religious in nature right we we tend to be apolitical but at least regardless of which you know uh end of the political spectrum you come from it is undeniable that yeah. the techniques of the magician are definitely used to manipulate people's opinions and and perceptions of the world. For sure. And this book is very much, uh, it's funny to say, it, a book about politics, but that's apolitical. It mm-hmm. is very da- straight down the road because misdirection is not a this side issue or that side issue. Yeah. It is it's an issue that as humans, you know, anytime somebody can take advantage of somebody for personal gain, it, it happens. And so it's not a book about getting people to think a certain way. It's really just a book about getting people to ask deeper questions. Mm-hmm. That's one of the things I love about magicians is that we're just constantly asking questions. How does this work? What could I do with this? You know, every day we see, I, I'll tell you what I saw on your um, Facebook, you posted a trick <laughs> that penguin sells that I am like ready to hit send on the, uh, the magic wand that makes the oh, X light. looks like X light. It looks like real magic. Okay, so real quick, um, <laughs> so I, I was playing House of Cards, and yeah. uh, Joey, uh, the entertainment director, said, "Hey, yep. would you do the, uh, the family brunch on Sunday?" Yeah. and I was like, oh, yeah, "Yeah, no problem." And then I got to think about it, and I was like, "Oh, it's Easter Sunday in Tennessee." And right. like a nine minute chunk of my act is a duck with prison <laughs> tattoos that smokes a cigarette. Maybe <laughs> don't have that for the kids on Easter right, Sunday right, morning. Right. Uh, so I panic bought X light and yeah. it is the single greatest object I've ever owned. It is so it good. <laughs> looks like real magic. Yeah. I, yeah, I literally I was just messaging Mark James. I'm like, dude, yeah. I don't know when I would do this or where I would do this, but I want to just have it so I can look in the mirror and go, oh. <laughs> My buddy Keith Fields, I sent him the, I sent him that dumb video that I posted on Instagram before I posted yeah. it of just like me finding the wand in a kitchen and then like producing this feather from light and he was like, send me the link. I'm buying this now. Yeah. It's yeah, it's too good. Yeah, it's yeah. You you I don't. Uh, yeah, you should have some sort of special deal with the creator <laughs> because I guarantee that video you posted is selling lots of those yeah. today. <laughs> what What made you decide to write a book about misdirection for the general public? Because I think that that's, you know, I mean, you've been a magician for a long time, so clearly you have a background in misdirection. Um, not right. necessarily like a. Because you're usually when I have somebody on here who writes a book for about misdirection for like the general public, it's a psychologist, and this is right, right, not right. that. No. Yeah, no. It's it was just noticing. Often, you know, you watch something on TV or you have a conversation with somebody about a situation they were in at work. Mm-hmm. Um, I do a ton of corporate entertainment, so a lot of my work is keynote or. Um, I, I, I've done some coaching with different clients in the corporate space and it's just fascinating to see how similar some of these scenarios they find themselves in. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, we use that same thing on stage constantly. Mm -hmm. And so I, I just thought, well, this is a different way to bring up some issues that people face that most people are never thinking the way magicians think, um, when it comes to these kind of, um, these kind of issues and topics. And so I, I just thought, well, what a great way to use magic as a metaphor for, for situations we all find ourselves in, even if we've never done a magic trick. Can you give an example from the book that somebody, you know, I mean, obviously the audience is largely magicians, but sometimes right. we overlook our own, you know, because we're too close to it, we don't see our own art in our own, uh, in, in, our, in our sort of like non-related stuff. 
You know oh, I mean? certainly. Oh, certainly. Yeah. So, I mean, I mentioned the the quarter and the salt shaker. Mm-hmm. I love that trick since I was a kid. It's, it's one yeah. that we all still will pull out from time to time mm-hmm. when you're at a dinner table with somebody. Uh, the thing about that that's fascinating to me is the whole premise. The reason you're able to steal the salt shaker is you make them think, I'm going to flip this quarter upside down. Mm-hmm. You, may, you convince somebody, the most important thing to me is this quarter. When you have no intention of doing anything special with that quarter, you just want to do something else, and it's a, it's a means of distraction. So um, oftentimes in business or in life, we, we're, we're faced with a challenge where we go like, how did I get the wool pulled over my eyes? And it mm. was like, well, what played the role of the quarter? What played the role of the salt shaker? Mm. That's another. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to just throw another one out. Another simple one is uh, I teach a version, a very simple version of, you know, uh, cutting a rope in half and putting it back together. Mm -hmm. And the idea that uh, very often, um, very often what will happen is, uh, you know, I'll cut a rope in half, make it look like it goes back together. But I never really cut the rope. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the whole trick was convincing you that something that was whole was broken Mm -hmm. and then I can take credit for fixing it. Yeah. And so there's some questions I think when we're dealing with like insecurity or feeling like we're not enough, where in your life is somebody making you feel like you're not whole Mm -hmm. so that they can take credit for putting you back together. That's an interesting idea. It sounds like, it sounds like it's a mix of like, uh, practical magic theory applied to everyday situations and a little bit of like, you know, self-examination mind, and mindfulness, cognitive behavioral therapy. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a it's a weird world. I uh, in a past life, um, and again, we don't get very political or religious mm-hmm. here on the podcast. But in a past life, uh, when I was younger, I spent years on staff at a church mm-hmm. where things went kind of sour. Yeah, and um, and so a lot of these, I ha- I have a one person show that that has some stories of magic in it, but no magic in it, called the Last Sermon, where mm-hmm. I talk about how. I fell in love with misdirection in a magic shop and then misdirection came into another part of my life and, and kind of mm-hmm. threw things off course. So yeah. I just think it's a good, it's a good way to get people to ask questions yeah. and to think, you know, where could things be better if, if I kind of applied some of these techniques that we're already dealing with as magicians. I think it's super interesting and definitely one of those, like uh, I've always been a fan of books that take sort of a principle or uh, something specific to an art or a field and then apply right. it to other things. Because I think that it's, it's one of the ways to get us thinking in new and unique directions. I mean, it's the same thing that we talk about in like coming up with a new presentation. Like what do you, right. what do you love? I love internet conspiracy theories and that's why I create oil and <laughs> yeah. water sequences so all cool. about the Mandela effect. Like, um, right. so it's, uh, but it's the same thing, but just applying it in a more practical way to get us to think more critically in our lives. Yeah, and there's so many things that magicians think about that most people, like we constantly are working on things like dual reality. Mm-hmm. And and I think the general public, you know, I, I, at least a, a, a portion of the general public, my, like my dad will be like, hey, did you see that thing on Facebook? And he doesn't realize that his version of Facebook is different than mine and everyone else's. But mm-hmm. oftentimes we're assuming everyone's seen the same thing, yeah. but but we're getting you know misguided or misled or or in some cases misleading ourselves because we assume that person came to that conclusion because they saw the same information I did, and that's just not the case. You know that is I think that that is something that magicians uh, the dual reality on the internet is something magicians fall for all the time, especially yeah. in the context of exposure, because right. like you know, with, with magic teaching tutorials and demos, I've actually got more comfortable teaching on YouTube now, a, because I'm very particular about what I'm going to teach. I'm taking it from sources that are essentially public domain, but I'm also understanding that you are not getting to penguins YouTube page. Like it's not like, yes, we are popular (laughs) on YouTube, but we are not as popular as ninja or, Right, right, right. Kylie Minogue or, you know, like it's, that's not getting fed, you know, Seth Meyer, like I, it took a while for Seth Meyer's late show clips to start getting fed to me because I I liked his particular brand of comedy from the, uh, uh, from when he ran Weekend Update, but it, it, the rest of it just wasn't getting fed to me because it is a dual reality we're experiencing on YouTube. And so whenever we... Exposure isn't great, but it's probably not as pervasive as we think it is. 
Yeah, I I would agree with that. I totally agree with that. I think that I think that sometimes magicians and and again I I really do believe and in this book I teach some basic magic tricks again yeah. things that are either public domain or versions that I adapted and made up so I could reveal. <laughs> do you yeah. know what I'm saying? Um, but I, I do think sometimes magicians we we get way worked up where we're fighting the wrong battles mm -hmm. and and I just think um, yeah. I, I don't I'm not all for magic exposure by any means, but I also think like, you know, if if somebody is interested in magic because they saw something, maybe we should just make some better magic to put out. Yeah. And have those things <laughs> get a little more attention than ex exposure videos, you yeah. know, so I want to shift the topic a little bit because you're one of the few performers that I know who produces and distributes their own specials. Yeah, which I think is interesting. I have a, a comedy friend named Michael Malone who has put out yeah. a couple of specials on Amazon and now you've yep. you've got one that is either just coming out or will be coming out soon as of this recording that you're talking about for YouTube yeah so so uh, by the time this comes out this uh, YouTube special will be out mm -hmm. um, I uh, so you and I both we have a similarity that we spend a lot of time with comedians yeah and so about half of my friends are professional magicians and about half of my friends are professional comedians. And a few years back, I noticed that magicians, we kind of have a terrible business model. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, uh, I would see magicians talk about comedians and go like, oh, they're making no money. They're making 20 bucks. You know, they're driving five hours to work for $50 at a comedy club. Mm -hmm. But comedians out of the gate don't make a ton of dough. Mm -hmm. But they're building an audience. So it's, I want to go around the country. I want to work on my act. I want to meet new people. Then I want to film something or record something, put it out, and then let that help me find an audience. Mm -hmm. And magicians, typically our business model is, I don't have an audience, but I want to find somebody with an audience, whether that's a school mm -hmm. or a club owner or a business who will hire me to, to basically borrow their audience for the evening. Mm -hmm. And it's a good business model, but ultimately it's, it's, um, you're constantly on a job interview, right? Yeah. And then I would watch my comedian friends who they hustle and they end up finding a pe group of people who connect with what they like to share about. And now they can turn up to a city and a hundred people will buy a ticket. Yeah. Um, so I basically, I, no, nothing I'm doing is, is unique or new. I'm just basically copying what I see my comedian friends do mm -hmm. of creating an hour working it out on the road and then putting it out um, and then doing that again. So I put out a special in 2020. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Perfect time. <laughs> <laughs> Just in time to right. never use that material again. <laughs> oh, man. We recorded in January January of 2020. Yeah. And then something happened. We won't talk about it. But, yeah. <laughs> um, but what was great is we put that out uh, on Amazon and a lot of people were home. And so that was super helpful. Um, to get people watching it. And then this new one um, that we recorded and I just put out on YouTube and just said, hey, I'll just see what happens with it. So um, what years is, ago, I... What is the oh, yeah, process for that like? I mean, I'm assuming that you're you're doing most of the filming yourself or with a small crew and you're taking yeah. advantage of like desktop publishing tools like DaVinci Resolve or Adobe Premiere that are, you know, pretty accessible these days. Yeah, so I, in both cases, uh, the first one, I worked with a, a friend out of uh, South Carolina who had a video production crew. Mm -hmm. um, we've done a lot of corporate events together. And what I noticed, you know, it's funny, we were filming in L.A. I live just outside of L.A. It's, it's, it's funny to think about, like, bringing in a crew from outside of the city. Mm -hmm. But I just had done so many events where it was event production where they had to get the shot. We're yeah. not going to do retakes you know, they're, they're doing crash edits to show the last day of a conference of here's what happened. Mm -hmm. and, I, and so I just knew these guys would get it done. And so, uh, yeah, the first special, I, I brought in a crew to film and, and edit it. And, uh, and we distributed that through a, a group called Comedy Dynamics. Mm -hmm. And then this next one, my buddy Chris Ruggiero, who many people know, he's a, uh, was a juggler for many years. He did a, a show called One Man Variety. Mm -hmm. um, but he's like the best video guy I know, and he's in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yeah, we filmed this one in Nashville. He basically, he, he filmed it all, and then he and I sat down frame by frame and decided what's in, what's out, and cut it. And, yeah, 
it's the, it's a lot more accessible now than it used to be. Like you said, you can get, you know, rel relatively inexpensive software. And if you, if you've got an eye for it and you're willing to put the time in, you can make something really cool at home. You know, I think a lot of people sort of, they think of Penguin as this like massive production house with like tons of editors and like, and the truth is there's like four of us right now. Yeah. And we're, oh, yeah. we're all capable of running cameras and we're, we're shooting on stuff that is, I'd say prosumer. I mean, we were right. using yeah, yeah. some black magic stuff for a while, but right now we really like the Sony a seven S because so it, yeah. it can see in the dark in, in, yeah. <laughs> in bars. Uh, but then we're using a mix of pretty accessible software to make these really high end looking demos and tutorials that, that look so good. And it's, it's all within, you know, reach of, of pretty much anyone these days. It's crazy to me how, I mean, I, I had a band when I was, you know, I'm 43. I've worked very hard to look older, mm -hmm. but I, when I was a kid, we had a, um, you know, we had a band and we paid thousands of dollars in the nineties mm -hmm. to record an album. And now it's like, there's better gear that you can get for under $300 to do on your MacBook. You yeah. know, it's, it's wild. So I think I also, I would just say this, um, I think in general magicians were very secretive, not even just with our secrets, but mm -hmm. with our material. Like for years I was like, I don't want to put a video out of that because then other people will be doing it. Yeah. And I would just encourage people like there, some of the best performers that exist on the planet today, no one's ever seen yeah. because we didn't happen to be at the bar mitzvah they were booked at or the corporate event they were booked at. Like, I just think we're robbing the world of beautiful stuff if we're not sharing what we got. So I, yeah, I kind of agree with you there. I think that, you know, some of the best performers, yeah. Is somebody else going to do it? Because I mean, cause magic is an art form based on imitation. Uh, right. And there's a, I think there's a lot magicians could learn from comics. Um, yeah. Cause you know, comedies, intellectual properties dealt with so much differently than magicians right. and, you know, putting more of our stuff out there just in performance uh, stuff is it's, it's really helpful to younger performers coming up to see a much broader, wider variety of stuff. For sure. I, For sure. And, and I think too, another thing that, that it helped me not be afraid to put stuff out is I started sharing more personal stories mm -hmm. and like I do a lot of storytelling autobiographical stuff, which is something I just saw comedian friends doing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's two ways as a magician to have someone not steal your act. Number one, uh, you know, be like Charlie Fry. Yeah. And just no one can actually do the stuff because you're so <laughs> skilled and amazing, right? Yeah. Or number two, tell personal stories. Yeah. And if they rip you off, they've got to lie and say that something happened to them that didn't. And and I think the audience can see through it. So I, I would, yeah, I just, I think that that's, that's the big thing is just like infuse more of your own life perspective experience into your show and it and, and then it's not so much about like oh i saw another magician do that trick people mm -hmm. walk away going well i feel like i really connected with that person you know i, I think some of the best comedy performer or comedy mag magic performers today are you know maybe we're seeing other people steal one or two bits from them uh the one that actually right. comes to mind the most is I keep seeing uh, people steal the hearing aid bit from Nick to Oh, from Nick. Yeah. Yeah. Which yeah. is like, you know, obviously that's not okay to steal that joke, but what you never see is people wholesale lifting the tricks because it's right. so personal to that person that even if you could re-engineer the method, you right. would never find yourself doing that because of all the things it took to get to that. Like I have published Nick the duck no yeah. one's going to do Nick the duck. Like it doesn't make sense for, I, I can't even think of another performer who'd even try <laughs> to do right. that routine. Um, well, and if they did, people wouldn't, I, I, I would argue that if people tried to do your routine mm -hmm. and then another performer did it, no one would even recognize it as the same routine yes. because there's so much of you in it. Yeah. Yeah. Because if you take that routine and change it to reflect you and your personal you know, experiences and proclivities, it's going to end up being a different routine. Right. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. So what was the decision to go with YouTube versus Amazon this time? Just the distribution house you were going with? And how did you get in touch with the distribution house? Because, I mean, making the special was one thing, but electing right. to put it up is a different <laughs> kettle of fish. Right. 
Right. Yeah. So the with the first one, you know, I reached out uh, to the distributor. It, it's it's interesting. It's hard to pitch conceptual ideas like, hey, mm -hmm. you know, give me some dough and I'll make this thing. It's a different thing when you say, here's a final product that's good quality and you can see what it's going to look like. Mm -hmm. Um, so that was a lot easier to get a distributor to pick it up because it was already created. It already existed. Mm -hmm. uh, with this one, though, I just thought, I just, again, watching my comedian friends who have had you know specials on Amazon and Netflix and some of them just deciding, I'm just going to put this on YouTube and mm -hmm. let it go out to whoever in the world wants to get it. Mm -hmm. I, I like that idea. So it's, um, it's scary. You know, there's a little bit of, you don't have the anonymity you do with like a Netflix or an Amazon mm -hmm. where people don't know who's watched it and who hasn't, you know, you, you've got that number next to it of how many <laughs> people have seen it. But I just, I just at the end of the day was like, you know, I, w the first one was on Amazon, but then you deal with like regional distribution. And, and so some people would mm -hmm. be like, Hey, I'm in Australia. I can't get it. Yeah. Or, you know, and so I just thought, well, let's just put it on there where anyone can see it anywhere and, and are, see what happens. Are you, charging for it on YouTube or you're just nope. monetizing it through the ads? Yeah. Yeah. And we just now, I mean, I've never been a big, uh, I haven't put a ton of things on YouTube and grown like that platform. So we just mm -hmm. now reached a point where I can monetize it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we just put, I just put it out for free. And if you have Amazon prime, that one's on there for free too. On prime, oh, really? So okay. yeah, they're both, they're both free. <laughs> and, uh, well, I mean, you know, it's, and going through a distribution house like you did with Amazon, there's there's different models that they have for right. that. And I imagine you went to a company that does comedy distribution. It probably wasn't a much of a tough sell because they were just like, oh, yeah, I mean, it's a comedy show with magic. But it's like right. it's the same thing that we're already distributing. It's just another title in our catalog. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, it's interesting. People are like, oh, how did you... Uh, it's a little inside baseball. People are like, Oh, would you make a ton of money selling that to the company? Here's the deal. Like, yeah, I, if you look at what I spent to produce these mm -hmm. and what I made off of them, it's, it's laughable, mm -hmm. but I'll tell you putting out a comedy special, uh, on Amazon and then having a corporate client go, Hey, we we're trying to decide between three people. Mm -hmm. All three of them were comedy and magic. All three did the magic castle. Mm -hmm. You had a special, it just makes a big difference yeah. for, so I, I think with any project, it's, it's always that question of like, it, sometimes you make a project just cause you want it to exist. But I do think it's always good to go. What do I want this to lead to or to bounce off of yeah. and then just design it for that. No, I think that that's, that's kind of interesting. I mean, essentially what you have is a, hour long sizzle reel yeah. that, that, you know, and especially if it's an old show that you're not doing anymore, I mean, you know, and they're going to see different material. I mean, that's, right. there's actually no reason not to put it out. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm all for it. I really, I used to be so nervous about like, Oh, I'm going to put this out and then I can't do it. Mm -hmm. And even now, I mean, there'll be times, especially for corporate events, I'll just do whatever I think is going to work that night. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes it's not the show I'm touring with it's like a routine that i put out on one of the specials and you realize mm -hmm. it doesn't matter like yeah. the idea you know uh jim gaffigan put out a new special the mm -hmm. whole world didn't see that so there's no way they saw my little magic show on youtube you know yeah. <laughs> you know what i mean like yeah um but i do think there's something uh, for magicians of like yeah don't be afraid to just burn material put it out there and new stuff will come. I think ideas mm -hmm. line up like Pez in a Pez dispenser. Yeah. And sometimes you're like, oh, I don't see any other new ideas. You just got to get those ones out of the way and then something else will pop up. I think that we are beginning to enter a sort of renaissance age of magicians taking cues from some of the more <sighs> underground is not the way to put it, but more DIY mm -hmm. artistic yeah. scenes. Because, you know, I mean... I don't know any city where you can't throw a rock without hitting a, a comedy show that's in a bar right. or a club. Oh, yeah. And it's the yeah. same with burlesque and, you know, and the, mm -hmm. a lot of music scenes are really self-produced. Like the, 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 oh, num sure. the number of people that are touring, you know, big clubs or anything like that is actually pretty small. It's yeah. And, uh, and so I'm seeing stuff like the Boston magic lab and sort of the Toronto magic guys are doing some stuff. You hear some stuff out in San Francisco and it's, it's really fun to see magicians starting to do that. And I think that if we 
can sort of spur on that culture, we can really have the art form move forward in a way. Oh, for sure. It's so I'm doing a tour right now, which is it's funny, like people go, Oh, that's so cool. Like, I, I remember seeing people say I'm going on tour. Mm -hmm. And I had this idea that they were in the grocery store one day, and someone plucked them out of obscurity and gave them a career. Yeah. And again, watching my comedian friends, uh, it is, it is literally you call a venue, mm -hmm. you work out a deal, you either do a split, or you do a, you know, you rent it, you four wallet and you sell the tickets. And I can't tell you, how well this has worked out to just mm -hmm. if you put out if you put out material where you have clips you can share on Instagram and TikTok and YouTube and say I'm coming to town, mm -hmm. people are looking for stuff to do. Yeah. So, um, yeah, there's nothing way there's nothing mysterious about it. It literally is call a venue, work out a deal with them, yeah. let people know you're coming, and and you can do a little tour. It's so fun. It's, Why not try it? It's insane how, like, it isn't a small amount of work. But it's not like you have no. to have agents and managers to right. I've done those little tours yeah. with with other comedians. You come up with a fun name for it and totally move on. And then like just, you know, you call, you know, you, you look up the comedy scene in the area and go, hey, can a magician come to town? You look up, you know, sketch comedy theaters like in Columbus, yep. we have the shadow box. And yeah, that's so many people come to the shadow box. But even like Upright Citizens Brigade and like you don't need to call uh -huh. the improv or the funny bone. Like, no, find little you know, little venues that are doing music or comedy already that are uh, just have that. They've got a stage and lights and mic. That's all you need. Yeah, it's for sure. And and I, I've been surprised at how welcoming the comedy and like alt scene and mm -hmm. improv scene. Like they just in that world for a lot of people, it's like summer camp, right? It's the best part of what we love about magic conventions and hangout. It's mm -hmm. like I, I just I love the idea of like sometimes we just need to we just need to believe in ourselves enough to go like, yeah, I'm going to give this a go. And, you know, don't, don't mortgage your house to do it maybe yeah. right out the gate, but be willing to lose $150 on renting a 50 seat venue and mm -hmm. hoping people turn up, you know? And you know, what's funny too, is that a lot of these like small shows, they love when somebody comes in from out of town because that person who's running that show is yeah. also got a job They've got yep. you know, their own things that are going. And so being able to not have to book that week or that month right. is You're sometimes right. such a huge win for them. Yeah. Because it takes it takes something off their plate. For sure. I mean, this is this is any any business you work in as a magician. You're just solving someone else's problem, mm -hmm. right? Like the same with these small venues, like you said, they're looking for acts to book, just like corporate clients. A lot of times we're trying to go, how can I be super impressive and get people to come to me? No, wait a minute. What's a problem the person you're trying to hire you has? Just solve that problem. And it makes it real easy for them to go, man, we've got everything lined up for this event. We don't know who's going to MC it. Well, I'll MC it. And I also do magic. Great. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, so just, just approaching approaching your business from like, Oh, what problem can I solve? How can I make someone else's life easier? Yeah. Is so much better than trying to just be people think you're cool and yeah. want to hire you for it. <laughs> it's yeah. It's, it's, in, it's funny how often that like no one is ever plucked out of obscurity. It's always, <laughs> you know, going yeah. out there and, and knocking on doors and figuring out how to do that. And yeah, if you do that enough, it will start to self-generate. It, and you know what, man, I, it's funny. I, I think we all with things like social media and putting out material, we're always like, oh, it's so much work and so little return. Mm -hmm. And, you know, is this any worth it? I, I had a video recently go insanely viral, like a, a clip from my special got 48 million views on Instagram, which is insane. <laughs> yeah. And people are like, how did you make that happen? I don't know. I put out 150 clips that got 20 views, a yeah. thousand views, 500 views. You know what I mean? Like you just, you never know what thing is going to click. You just got to make mm -hmm. things that you're proud of and share them and hope that there's people who will connect with it. So I uh, just, I say that mm -hmm. not to go like, Oh, look, look at, I had a video go crazy. I say that to go, if you're sitting there right now going, why am I spending the time to do this? Mm -hmm just keep going gang. Like you're, you're doing good work. People need to see what you're doing and just believe in yourself enough because no one else is waking up today going, how can I make 
that person's career pop, you know, yeah. everyone's just got their own issues. Like you got to believe in what you're doing. And, uh, and I'll, I'll just be a little cheerleader going, mm-hmm. let's go. We can do it. <laughs> Taylor, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Before we go, where can people find the book? Where can people see the specials? Yeah. So the, uh, the book is available. You can get on Amazon. It's probably the easiest place, but it's available uh, a bunch of different places. Misdirection, a magician's guide to spotting and avoiding manipulation in your life. Uh, I'm on tour right now. I'm doing a feel good magic tour. Mm -hmm. And, uh, those dates are at taylorhughes.com. And then, uh, the special, I've got one called chasing wonder on Amazon prime for free and one on YouTube called enjoy the ride for free. And, um, yeah, we'll, we'll put links it. to those in the show description below so people can go check it out. Taylor Hughes. Thanks so much for joining us on the penguin magic podcast. Thanks for letting me crash the party, man. I love the show and I'm grateful to be a part. That's going to do it for this week, kids. Thanks so much to Taylor for being on the show. And thanks to you for listening to our loyal listeners. There's nothing to worry about with the sudden format change. I've been moving my home studio. I record this interview and edit the show and the variety of equipment, gear, toys, and internet access wasn't set up to produce this week's episode. The new place is in the process of getting set up. And what that means is that the YouTube version of this podcast is about to get a crazy upgrade in quality. Yeah, that's right. For you audio listeners, you can actually watch these interviews on YouTube. I video record everything. And that's important, not just so that you can see your favorite magicians, but it's really important because sometimes when Nick and I record, our dogs Rocco, Bellatrix, and Archie join us during the chat, and that means the show is going to get like 8,000% more adorable dog content. You've been warned, it's about to get real cute up in here. As always, we're a weekly podcast, so be sure to like and subscribe as well as share your favorite episodes on the social media platform you've been shopping for new studio decor on. If you wanted to reach out to me about anything on this week's show, you'll have to get inside my new paint swatch collection. I don't know what color to paint the walls in this new studio. Suggestions will be appreciated. But if decorating a new place isn't your cup of tea, you can always hit me up on Instagram at Eric Tate. That's at E-R-I-K-T-A-I-T. From me and everyone else here at the P3 Magic Studios, practice, practice, performed.